Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Great. Hi, everybody. I am Michael Golombeski. I'm here from the University of Nottingham, and I'm going to be talking about basically what I do and some of my work, which should be which should be really good. First off, that's um, that's my name. That's me. And I'm going to first off start by introducing basically what it is that I do and what sort of projects I tend to work on. I'm a practice-led design researcher who basically um, basically looks at the ways that people use technology, and and in particular, I look at the way that people kind of incorporate technologies into creative processes and practices. Now, by that you mean um, by that I mean how people use technology to make things. <laughs> there, there are lots of different ways that pe there are lots of different types of creative process and practice. You've got process through designers. I tend to do some some interventions looking at how how technologies might be developed to support design practice, which I'll be touching on inside of this through a, through a description of a cards-based methodology that I put together. Well, methodology might be too strong of a word, technique, let's say. Um, I also, in the past, I've looked at how photographers use creative process through a set of um, through a set of hardware-based interventions where I started designing homemade digital cameras using hacked scanner backs, which was a really fun project that I worked on for a few years. But what I'm going to be talking about here is my thesis project, where I basically started doing some research looking at a really simple question. What I was looking at was I, start, I started thinking about artists in creative process. And I asked myself, how can, how can we as sort of HCI-based designers, human computer interaction specialists, how can we better design tools and technologies to support the process activities of professional artists? And again, by process activities, I mean the things that artists do in order to make their artwork, the sort of the steps that lead from idea to art. So I start, again, I decided that I was going to address this problem through practice. I'm a practice-led researcher. Um, my, my background previous to my studies of HCI are in, are in design practice and arts practice. And I figured that the best way to go about looking at how we might be able to better support artist practice is by designing and implementing an exemplar artist tool. What I'd do is I'd make an example artist tool, figure out what worked and what didn't work over that process, and use that as my benchmark for figuring out the best ways to engage with artists. So, started where all good designers start with when you're, when you're looking at technologies and specific user groups. I started by considering the user. And I asked myself, okay, who's an artist? Now, now, the immediate answer, answer is, is very simple. An artist is someone who creates art. But then that implies a certain correlative, what is art? And all of a sudden, I've gone from a very simple question describing the artist to a very complex one. Now, it sits well outside of the usual scope of HCI discourse in that most HCI artist engagements tend to rely more on tacitly understood or outdated models of art. And that's to be expected. By tacitly understood, you say, yeah, we know who artists are, but your conception of an artist might be different from your conception of an artist might be different from yours, or outdated models of art, by which I mean ones that sort of place the emphasis of what is or isn't art on the type of physical manifestation. So it's sort of like art is painting, art is sculpture, art is, art is some, some particular use of a type of media. And to me, these seemed, like, these seemed like descriptions of artistic practice that perhaps could, perhaps getting a bit of clarity on how these work could be potentially useful for, for the overall problem at hand. After all, I mean, HC, this might be a relatively new ground for HCI, but artists, historians, philosophers, they've been debating this for millennia. Some of the oldest history texts that we have deal with, deal with issues of what is art. Some of the oldest philosophy that we have deals with the same questions. So as a means of clarifying my understanding of the artist as my user, I conducted a bit of research into the philosophy of art. And I'm going to be talking about that a little bit. and. To a degree, this is going to step a little bit far outside of, outside of the field of standard talks about HCI, but it's going to come back into, into relevance. So you'll have to bear with a little bit of a little bit of a description of art theory, a little a little sort of art theory primer dealing with some matters of contemporary art right now. So I'll start talking about that now. You should bear in mind this is first thing in the morning, so you might struggle getting the audience to really on these ones. <laughs> it'll 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 get interesting. There's there's pictures coming up. <laughs> All right, so HCI as a discipline sometimes has a little bit of trouble distinguishing art from non-art. And a perfect example of that is inside of a lot of the literature in HCI, you find a certain conflation of the fields art and design. Now, as somebody who studied design and as, as somebody who works as a design practitioner, 
examining the tensions between art and design is a big part of your undergraduate studies. Certainly, it's a big part of your, your, your master's studies, definitely. And if you ask any artist or any designer, there are very different types of activities. So, what we have here is a problem of artistic identification. We need to be able to point and say, that's art, that's not art. That's the core of sort of, of a lot of contemporary art, art theory. It's not a problem that's unique to HCI or design research or, or these sorts of things. It's also a hefty philosophical problem. And it's one that goes back for quite a bit. And now I'm going to introduce a bit of theory here where in 1964, it's sort of the, the dawn of pop art. It's in New York City. Philosopher Arthur Danto, he was at, he was at um, Columbia University, went to go and see an exhibition of Andy Warhol, and he found himself directly confronted with this issue of artistic identification. So in, he walks into the exhibition, and in the exhibition, it's sort of a groundbreaking piece of pop art, he sees a series of Brillo brand soapboxes. They look just like this. They're stacked up inside of the gallery. People are, people are it's the talk of the town in terms of, in terms of the New York art scene at the time. And what Danto observed was that these boxes are, in all physical respects, they were absolutely identical to the, to the very same boxes that he found displayed in the shop window around the corner. He goes around the corner and he sees these Brillo boxes. They, they are materially, they're formally, they're physically exactly the same as the boxes that are up in the gallery. So, he starts asking himself, what makes Andy Warhol's boxes artworks and what makes the ones in the shop window just soap boxes? And he explored this in a, in a kind of groundbreaking essay called The Art World in 64. And what, it, what, it, what, what he realized was that these artworks were physically identical. There was no sort of, there was no tangible difference between the two. So if that's the case, then he kind of realized he's an analytic philosopher, so basically they deal with concepts like people in geometry deal with proofs. It's, it's formal logic, it's direct connections. And, and he, he, he reasons that the distinction between art and non-art isn't related to material property, but it's related to critical context. And he posited that sort of any recognition of an artwork or distinction between what's not art and what is art requires some critical model deciding what's art. You can't, you can't say what art is, you can't say something's art or not art unless you already have an idea of what art is. I know it's a bit heavy for this early in the morning. And by thinking about that, he realized that these theories are fundamentally art historical in nature because they all involve some degree of comparison between an artwork and an idea of an artwork that's based in other artworks that you've seen. Philosophy definitely is not an early morning subject. Um, so, because of this, he pointed out two things that, that, that were very interesting. Is that, first off, since the body of critical theory that lets you sort of figure out whether something's art or not art is historically determined, it's first off culturally defined, as in history gets passed on by people. Secondly, it's fluid. It changes from time to time to time. As things change, what's art changes over time. And he, he referred to the societal embodiment of the artistic understandings and theories that makes, make, make this possible as the art world. These are sort of the, the ideas transmitted by galleries, by, by museums, by universities, by cultural institutions, by histories. He, he, he talked about the embodiment that as an art world, and it's through engagement with this art world that things become art or not art. So it's not whether it looks like something, it's not whether it's pretty, it's not whether it's got anything to do with, with, a, with its aesthetic properties. And he furthermore introduced an idea called the style matrix as a way of explaining how this worked critically in practice, as a way of understanding how these multiple meanings of art might interrelate. Because there's not just one meaning of art, there's many, and they change over time. So, so he started asking, how does that happen? And he, he figured that any way that you can understand an artwork, you can consider it as a sort of stylistic predicate. By predicate, it's something that kind of implies its opposite. You end up with a continuum. It's, um, you've got art of this type, art of not that type. And I'm going to give a couple of examples to make that a bit easier. So, you, can, you might understand art as expressive, or it's correlative, non-expressive in nature. So that's two ways of understanding art that form a predicate. Another one might understand, describe art as being representative or non-representative in nature. So, that's, so that's, that's another predicate. With these two predicates, we actually have four ways of understanding the identity and merit of something that might be an artwork. You could have representative art, non, representative, non-expressive art. You could have expressive, non-representative art or any combination of the two. So, so what he did was he, he put together this style matrix where you have two to the p potential understandings of a given artwork, or whether or not it might or might not be an artwork, with p being the number of predicates supported by the history of art. 
So what this says is this actually turns into kind of an almost mathematical proof of showing how as art history evolves and new ways of understanding art get added to the matrix, art itself changes and grows. And now this is groundbreaking because, because previous to this, every time that somebody came up with a new idea for how art might work, you had to go back and rewrite the entire history of art. Whereas Danto's model of the art world was inclusive and flexible in a way that previous models hadn't been. But, and this is the important bit, and this is where it starts to come back to HCI. Danto noted that while, while all the predicates are theoretically equally valid, in practice, different subsets of the art world place different values on each. And if we think about this, you can definitely see it. You've, you've got the sort of, um, the way I like to think about it is you've got sort of the experimental art that goes on, experimental contemporary art world in the way that you'll find in sort of in London and Hackney happening there versus the American Southwest art painting, painting scene that paints sort of pictures of landscapes cows, horses, these sorts of things. They've both got their, their distinct sets of ideas as to what makes art valid or not. In their own views, the, 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 the weights that they give to different sort of stylistic aspects of the work tend to be very different. And what's nice about this is that this, this distinguishes art from being something that's linked to aesthetic property and turns it to something that's linked to social and historical context. And taken as a whole, Danto's views, and, and there are some similar views. You've got, um, you've got philosopher Bruce Dickey, who actually explicitly places the people rather than the history at the identity of art. You've got Beckers, who's very interesting, who took a sociological perspective of Danto's work. And you can, you can take these theories of how art works in this sort of culturally defined and historically defined sense and call them institutional perspectives. So what I decided to do was that as a grounding introduction to my research, I decided to adopt a loose inst institutional understanding of art. And that's loose in the aesthetic philosophy term, where sort of a misplaced comma changes the complete meaning of an argument. I decided to take a loose institutional understanding of art as a means of framing my preliminary understanding of arts and artists. And this, this gave me a number of advantages when I, started to, when I started to start to approach artists from a research perspective. First off, it provided me a really useful means of distinguishing art making from other similar but distinct activities. Art making were things that related with the critical context of the art world in some way, explicitly by the people who are making it, versus design, which may use a lot of the same techniques, you may do a lot of the same activities, you may even get similar outcomes. But the intention is different from the intention of the artist. And that, and that, that, set, that set up a very clear way of distinguishing artists from other types of practice. Second, it highlighted the need to consider artist activities in a broader socio-professional and evaluatory context. So, so when you're looking at what artists do, you don't just look at what they do in terms of individual creativity or craft or expression. You also look at their engagement with their, their particular focal subsets of the art world. You look, at the ways that they, you look at the ways that they engage with galleries. You look at the ways that they engage with critical theory along with, with material craft as a means of figuring out what, why they're doing what they're doing. And the acknowledgement of the fact that the art world's both social and fragmented, that there are subsets of the art world that exist, highlighted actually a fact that up until now, when you look at HCI research, it actually tends to deal with a very limited subset of artists in art making. First off, it tends to deal with technocentric artists. And by technocentric in this sense, I'm talking about artists who make work that either incorporates technology in the final form, in that it lives on a screen, it's got projections, it's got computer controlled media, or else you deal with artists that deal with technology as a critical theme. So artists that are actually making commentary on technology. Now, it's of course to be expected that these are the sorts of artists that HCI researchers tend to engage with. I mean, we're dealing with technology. Artists that work with us tend to be artists that also work with technology as, as an explicit and sort of central focus of their work. But it also highlights a group that artists te that HCI tends not to deal with in that outside of technocentric artists, there's, there's a real aversion inside of HCI towards dealing with professional, contemporary, gallery-focused fine artists. Like sort of the artists that you'll find when you go to, when you, when you pick up a copy of art form, those tend not to be the artists that we see when, when we start dealing with HCI and the artist. So I decided to examine the practices of a, of a group of these underrepresented artists. I'd set, up myself, I set, I'd set myself up a nice critical grounding in terms of how I was going to approach artists, and now I needed a little bit of practical work. So I decided I was going to deal with a group of non-technocentric, gallery-focused, professional fine artists. And I basically hit contacts, I started, I started putting the word out, and I assembled a small group of early, mid-career, and established artists to work with as test subjects for a while, to start to back this kind of critical, ins these critical insights that I've got from hitting the books with real-world insights that I got from looking at what artists do. 
And the artists that it picked up were, th these are a bit of the works to give you an idea as to the, so the sorts of artists I was working with. One of them was Polly Applebaum, who does these, th these are beautiful. These are actually hand cut small sort of dyed pieces of fabric that she arranges in patterns on the ground. It's another one of her works. Juan Fontenive, who builds these sort of mechanical things. These are actually flip books. Do you know the alarm clocks that have the numbers that flip over? He makes those, but he hand paints animations on them. They flip over. Another example of his work is, this is, um, do you know the snake toys that you had when you were a kid? This is that done to ridiculous scales. He would go into the gallery every morning and rearrange them. Another artist that I worked with is Sinta Tantra, who focuses on surface and wall as, as a potential vehicle for artwork. This is all hand painted. Again, that's another piece that she did. She did the ceiling piece there. Alison Vieira, who deals with sort of um, who deals with concepts of archaeology, her work's a, a bit less approachable than the previous ones, but she deals with architectural architectural material and sort of conceptions of space and the passage of time. These are actually massive blocks of plaster that she put together. And Ulrika Strombeck, who does um, who did who did smaller scale work, she worked both with wire and also with clay as a material, looking at the the materiality of the form. So these are all plastic artists. These are all artists who you wouldn't think these are technologically focused artists when you look at them. And over the course of a year, I got to know these artists and their studio practices using a variety of methods. I conducted multiple observational studio visits with each artist where I'd go in and sort of be a fly on the wall, sit and watch them as they, as they, went, through their, as they went through their daily routines in the studio. I attended lots of their exhibitions and insisted in the installation of their work in some cases as a means of getting, getting some better ideas as to how they, how they did what they did. I conducted full literature review and portfolio reviews of each, and this is something that I, th that I thought was very important, looking at what they wrote about their own work, how they actually critically positioned their work, and getting to know their, their bodies of work as a cohesive whole I thought was very important. And I conducted extended semi-structured interviews with each of the artists after going through, these, after going through the, previous, the previous research endeavors to, to basically get their take on why they did what they did. And I maintained ongoing dialogues with each artist over the, over, the, over the course of that year. And by the end of the year, I'd amassed a huge amount of information concerning what they did in the studio all day. First off, one bit that I thought was very interesting was that all the artists devoted significant time to research activities of a variety of sorts. So you think that artists just sit around contemplating the muse and making things all day? No, a huge part of it was actually research orientated. This included traditional literature-based research, and something that I found interesting was that each one of these artists had a massive personal library of source texts that were specific to their practices. Technical research was extraordinarily common, figu figuring out how to make things, material process, material technique. That, now, this, this would take place everything from getting machinist tech books, textbooks. Fontenive, who did the flip books, actually took a watchmaker's course as a means of figuring out how to build small mechanic, mechanical devices. And a bit that was very artist-specific, I thought, was situated research, where artists would put themselves into the way of inspiration, sort of to the point where, um, where Vieira, who did the large plaster pieces, she actually ended up working on archaeological digs in Greece as a means of getting sort of inspiration about, about the materiality of classical Greek, Greek sculpture that she was creating work in, in relation to. They also conducted professional research, which, which would be dealing with um, where, where can I get an exhibition? What residencies are available? How can I start, how can I start creating new works? How can I, how can I get funding to get, get these works done that I have an idea for? Now, now, after the research, one thing that was interesting was that drawing was absolutely universal amongst these artists. All of them spent significant time drawing, even though only Vieira created drawings that were intended to be artworks. They all felt that drawing was extraordinarily important to the formation of their work as a whole. Now, a lot of these drawings were actually practical drawings. They were diagrams, using drawing as thinking, sort of, um, sort of sketching out problems, making diagrams to solve technical problems, making, making sketches to solve to solve formal problems that they, might, that they might encounter in their work. But they also created contemplative drawings, which were similar, but these were drawings that they'd make to work out conceptual or critical concerns, or visual concerns. Like an interesting thing that I remember is that Fontenive showed me a sketchbook, and he devoted about four hours per day to drawing. He showed me one of his sketchbooks um, where it was actually a single shape that repeated over and over and over and over again. And it, and it was interesting, and it felt like he was obsessing until you looked at his work that he did concurrently with it, and that shape appeared in all of his sculptural forms. So even though he wasn't making drawings as artworks, they were definitely informing the artworks. And another issue that all of the artists had as a constant concern and aspect of their work was documentation, both of their finished work and also of the process, was a constant and very, very highly considered aspect of their work. <laughs> sort of the idea being that 
they'd, they'd need to document their work. But they'd, on the one hand, they'd want their photographs to look good. On the other hand, they wanted, them, they wanted the focal point to be the artwork and not the photograph. It's a very, very subtle tension, but a very important one to them. So they didn't want the photographs to look too good, to look too polished. Now, after these, after these sort of subsidiary things, the, the most important aspect to all of them was in-studio material explorations. Now, they'd call them different things. In-studio material explorations is my term for what was going on. They'd, they'd call it messing around. A lot of them called it studio time. It's, it's being in the studio all day, every day, working on stuff. They'd create studies, prototype artworks, and models as a means of building artistic understandings, as a means of informing what their work might be. And this was considered an absolute necessity, and it was something that, that required rigid routine. So it's not just something that they did when they had an idea for a project. This is something that they, that they did at least four days a week for, for an entire day. This was, this was a massive part, part of their working routine. And, and the slowness of this, that sort of that time-consuming aspect of this material practice, they saw as extremely valuable because it allowed for the gradual building of insight. Like, um, do you remember Applebaum's works with the, small, the thousands of small cut pieces of fabric? She insisted that cutting them by hand was essential to the process because she said that that's when she figured out what the final form was going to be. The hand cutting, the hand dyeing was actually what made it, made it possible for her to get her ideas. That gave her the time to let things kind of ruminate. And they, they observed that, in particular in Applebaum's case, but for all the artists, that this, this, this was actually very artistically relevant. This is where the meaning of their work came from the time it took to make it. And, last, and, and another, another issue that they all saw as being very important was the situational aspects of their work. And that, and that with, for these sorts of artists, they're all somewhat sculptural in, in, in their practices. The relationship between the work and its environment was, actually, was oftentimes essential to the meaning. So Applebaum's pieces on the floor, Vieira's kind of um, kind of plaster plaster sculptures, Fontenay's kind of kind of snake sculpture. The relationship between the work and the space that the work was in was what made the work. Now, not all of the art the works are like this. Um, Ab, um, Vieira pointed out that, that she had some works that, that were her nomad works, and these were ones that she'd she'd be able to put mainly in group shows where you have less kind of autonomy. In term, in term, in discretion, in terms of your relationship with the curator, and um, and another, and this this brings it into the idea of exhibitions as we start talking about curators, and that the exhibition provided the overall structure for activity for all the artists. Like uh, Fontaine even pointed out that yeah, I'd just spend all my time messing around and playing with things unless I had a deadline to work to. So so the exhibitions provided the overall kind of activity structure for the artists as they're working in, as they're working, and. This brings it into the idea of how exhibitions work. And the, the, these, were, these were interesting because it's a highly nuanced and very tacitly understood. There's no book that you can get that says how an art world exhibition functions. But alongside of the contracts that say you will deliver this work by this date, there were really nuanced and tacitly understood protocols describing how, how work gets into the gallery. Things like, um, things like well, if you have a solo exhibition, you have, there's an expectation. If you have a solo exhibition, that better be brand new work that nobody's ever seen before. And if not, and where, whereas in a group exhibition, you might be able to show something that you've shown somewhere else. Things along these lines. Not stated, but, but very much understood. And, and to go along with this, a bit that made it more interesting was all the artists pointed out that their social and professional lives are coupled to the point of being indistinguishable. Sort of, in, in the art world, your social life is your professional life and vice versa. And this doesn't just mean that you hang around with other artists, but it meant, but it meant you also hang around with other curators, art handlers, art dealers, people along these lines. And, and something, something that was pointed out that I thought was interesting was that careers tend to progress in tandem and collectively. Like um, one of the artists called it a concurrent rise in agency, where as you progress as an artist, your friends that are curators are also equally progressing. And, 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 and they, sort of build, they sort of lift each other's careers concurrently, which I, which I found fascinating. So after a year, I had this huge amount of observational data and I could keep gathering it and gathering it and gathering it, but I needed to make something. So I reconsidered my original goal, which was to design a tool to aid and assist professional artists in their professional activities, or in their processing activities. That was too many professionals in one sentence. And it's an interesting project brief, but I, found, but I thought it was a little bit vague. So what I did was I'd worked with a card-based ideation technique I'd been developing as a means of exploring my own process as a designer as a means of adding some specificity to the problem while still keeping to the spirit of the original project brief. So I had, this, I had this vague project brief to design a tool to aid professional artists in their process activities. That could be pretty much anything. 
So with the original problem in mind, I formulated a set of project-specific suits relevant to the original design. And here I'm going to list three of them. One suit was around activity. What, what sort of activities are they doing? One suit was around context. And one suit was around types of technologies that might be able to be developed. And here, these are, these are a few ideas. So the activity suit, I, I chose sort of cards to go into these suits. You've got drawing activity, you've got material exploration. One bit that I didn't focus on was all of the artists had particular collection behaviors where they'd collect images, which was fascinating, sort of either digitally or physically. They all had massive archives of collected images, and the ways they looked at them was interesting. They had model making activities, sort of building things, and there was technical research. Another suit was context. So inside of this, you've got professional context, practical, practical things like the practical drawings, the practical model making, problem solving sort of issues. You've got the kind of combined socio-professional context that they worked inside of. You've got the idea of creative contemplation, and you've got the situatedness of work. These are, these are sort of various contexts that might be applicable. And you've got technologies, sort of platforms that I might want to develop inside of. This was more on my side, but I based it on the technologies that artists already, that I'd already observed present inside of the studio. Figured cameras, laptops, tablets, phones, and video were ubiquitous amongst all the artists that I was dealing with. So I made cards for all these, and then I dealt the cards into a 3x3 three three grid. And what's interesting about these is that each one of these rows inside of the grid suggests a project brief that fits the terms of my original project brief, but adds some specificity. So I can take my idea of design a technology to support artist process activities and say, I could say, design a technology using a laptop to support artists' drawing process-based drawing activities in a professional context. Or I could say, design a model make design a technology to support model making activities that uses a laptop and focuses on the situated aspects of work. All of these things sort of meet the terms of that original, con that original project brief that I described, but they add a level of specificity and some really concrete boundaries to push against. And as a designer, having those kind of concrete, concrete rules and kind of boundaries to push against is what, to me, what leads to good design. And I, fe I felt that these rows and columns using this card-based technique started to suggest more specific avenues for design activity. Again, in particular, the idea of dealing with situated contexts, laptops, and model making, or professional contexts, laptops, and drawings, really highlighted some things that had come out inside of the interviews that I thought, that I thought could be worked with. Now, the state of the, the, state of the professional art world, the, the, the fine art world that these artists were engaged in, dictated that they needed to work in relation to an international network of galleries and venues. Quite frankly, there's not enough galleries in, even in New York and London. Some of these artists were based in New York, others were based in London. They were split between the two. The, paradoxically, the New, York, the New York artists tended to be represented in London. Having a gallery representation in, for, for fine artists is like having an agent as, a, as an actor. The, 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 your gallery representative is, is who promotes you and, produce, and basically produces your work. Um, all of, this, all of this work ended up taking place inside of an international context. And there's an expectation that new shows result in new works, particularly with solo exhibitions. So the fact that when you take that in combination with the fact that the situated and situational aspects of the artist's works means that they're creating new work for spaces that they have no access to, this presents a problem that, that HCI is actually very well equipped to solve. There, in that their current means of understanding these spaces. So you're an artist in New York. You get an exhibition in London. You've got to create work to respond to a gallery space that you've never seen, that you have no access to, unless you want to hop on a plane and fly across the world to see it and then go back, which just isn't really an option. So the way that this tends to be dealt with now is you get a floor plan image emailed to you by the gallery rep and you work in relation to that. Now, anybody who's worked with floor plan images knows that first off, what file format you're going to get them in, particularly when you're dealing with non-architectural gallery reps. They're, they're not architects, they're, they're gallery representatives. Could be anything from, I'd, I'd seen some that look like drawings on a napkin, to CAD files. You've got, no standard, you've got no standard image format, you've got no standard fidelity, and all in all, it's, it's a horrible way to understand a space. So what I, what I figured was, how can we maybe design a technology to support, to, to support artists in building these visualizations to help them create their situated works by aiding in physical and virtual model making? I might find a way to, to work inside of this existing problem and make something that solves it. So this is a direction to myself, not to you. And now I'm going to switch over from the PowerPointy black background white slides presentation to 
a demo of the software that I developed as a means of addressing this. Because as I, as I framed that reformulated problem, I figured that designing a tool that, that might allow artists to engage with this could work quite well. So I put together this application where what you've got is a gallery floor plan. This is, this is the sort of image that artists would end up getting emailed to them. And what I did was I wrote a quick bit of software that lets you load, this, load in the image. This is just a JPEG laid over floor image. And it's got some very simple drawing tools that let you start to trace out the walls in the image. Now, manually tracing this is interesting, first off, because as we're dealing with kind of, um, as we're dealing with source imagery that's from a variety of different sources, there's no guarantee as, as to how this might be able to be automated. There's also no guarantee as to what features might or not, might not be salient to the artist. So I put together a tool that very quickly and easily lets you start to trace the walls. You can see I'm, I'm just sketching out a few of them. I'll leave some of them untraced for time. It's, it's quite simple and intuitive to use. It lets you adjust the height of the walls. And it lets you set a model scale. Because it, the, the goal of this is that it, it, it puts together um, a kit to help you design a foam core model. So it lets you set the scale of the model here, the thickness of the foam core board that you're going to use there. And very quickly, it lets you switch over from your 2D representation to a representation of the model itself that, that, that might be able to be, get built. So this is, this is one way of sort of starting to visualize that gallery in a different sort of way. It also lets you switch over to, now this is something that, <laughs> all right. That, you know, actually this is a funny thing is that one of, one of the bits that was interesting about it is, is that this figure is the stock figure that ships with. I ended up after going through a few different ways of potentially using this. I, I used, I made a JavaScript implementation. I made, I made a couple of homebrew implementations using WebGL and, that, and eventually ended up switching over to the Unity engine. This is a stock Unity character. Now, I'd wanted to switch it out to a figure that fit into the art world context a bit better, find somebody who looked a bit like one of the artists. The problem is, is that tracking down a rigged character model that looks like a normal person who might be inside of a gallery is extraordinarily difficult. I mean, if you want a barbarian with a broadsword or a fighting robot, models like that are a dime a dozen to find for free. But to get actually a rigged character model that looks like a normal person was, was beyond my means as a PhD student. Do we know an artist? Yeah, I think that's the most important. Actually, yeah, yeah. If, if, you know, that would be easier now. See, at the time, the beards hadn't quite taken off. I could pop a beard on him and, and it would be, yep. This, this is another feature that was like a, oh, forgot about that. The lower walls feature, so you could actually get them inside of the space. But what you've got now is you've got a, um, you've got a situation where this actually, the ability to do these kind of virtual walkthroughs in the gallery, provides sort of a, a situated way of understanding what that space might be like to inhabit in a way that looking at the floor plan itself, the relationship between the floor plan and the person gives you a very different perspective on how that space might function. So just obvious question. So the height of the avatars always absolute, whereas the walls are, can, can be relative or they or they uh, same relation there. Yep, one of my um one of my point B's, and it's interesting because the um the the inclusion of the figure and also the inclusion of when you switch over to this view, which is a representation of a scale model of the space. I, I included a handprint there that as you adjust the scale of the model, so say you made that model as a 1 100th scale model, your hand would be that big in relationship to it. As you change the scale of the model, the handprint changes, changes size accordingly. But the, um, in a perfect world, that would be configurable to the user, so that would actually be your height. And the reason why is, is that something that I noticed in my interviews, this is a kind of a tangent that came in from the interviews with the artists, is that every time that they described the physical size of anything, they'd use themselves as the frame of reference. So when Vieira described those, those big plaster columns she was talking about, before I'd seen the work, she said, oh, this is, um, they're, they're three times bigger than me, or it's as big as my arm. And every time that size was discovered, they used an egocentric frame of reference. And I thought that that was fascinating, so I wanted to build that in. So, so to answer your question, in a perfect world, the height of the artist, the artist stand-in would be your height. To, to afford giving you a better understanding of the size of the space. As of right now, it's kind of the average, um, the average height of a person, 1.8 meters, something like this. Mm -hmm. So, so, but
but the the wall height can be can be adjusted. Now now something else that was interesting was um, was it's one thing to have the, the the virtual representation of the space, but given the tactility of the artist space and also the idea that you understand things physically different than you understand them on screen, I wanted to have a physical output for this. So what I did was I built an exporter that lets you. Let me just get to the desktop. And I'll call it demo. When you click export, I'll quit that for now. Now when I go to the desktop, I've got this demo folder, which actually has printable and exportable templates that export directly to Illustrator that you can print out using your printer. You can tile it. And this is exporting to Illustrator because Illustrator was the universal software package that the artists were familiar with. That was what, that was what they used to, to do these things. You can export that, and you can also export each one of the individual walls that made up the, the document itself. Had, a, had an original numbered and scalable document that could be printed out, glued to foam core card, and used to very quickly construct a physical model of the space itself. They are sent photographs of the space sometimes, but sometimes photographs of the space actually end up being more problematic. And the reason why is, is that anybody who's sort of like gone to, and this is something that the artist had talked about, is that, is that any time that you get photographs of a space, if you think about it the way that you get sort of realtor's photos or estate agent photos, photographs of the space tend to accentuate the details of the space rather than give a conception of the physical dimensions of the space. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, and, that, and that's something that I think would be fantastic. The idea, um, the idea from a technological standpoint, in particular, taking things like photographs and dynamically calculating the geometry of the space based on photographs, I think would be a really interesting take. It was technologically outside of, outside of the scope of this. But I, I, yeah, I think that that's a good point. So how did you get it so close to share everything, like a collaborative framework? It's a final set of exposition room. So I guess if I spend time to build a modeling of a particular room, so it's for sharing, I guess. By sharing, it can be improved by others, etc. So does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. Sort of, sort of, a, sort of, a, sort of a, a shared, basically, repository of gallery. Yeah, so do you take this into account? Or? I did, you know, and that came that came about when I started to move out when when I started with my deployment of the system itself. I'd moved. I'd, I'd I'd tested it with the original artist. This is Fontenive, sort of using the system to build a model of a gallery that he had an upcoming exhibition inside of. But 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 when I started to do my presentations, I'd I'd started to move the scope outside of practicing artists into related figures, and and the people who were actually really interested in this were curators, thinking that oh, I wish that I had kits like this that I could just send out to artists. That I work with, or I wish that I could, I wish that I could basically have an on-demand laser cutting service to ship out very quickly and easily a model of my gallery to 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 artists who might be working inside of my space. Did you, did you run to the end, we, we yeah, certainly. <coughs> so 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 in addition to in addition to these sorts of presentations, I also started presenting it with curators, architects, and gallerists. Architects were interested. They, architects were interested because they liked the quickness that you could move from 2D to 3D. So, so, so they immediately pointed out the flaws in modeling architecture with a system such as this. Stuff like varying level floor heights, wall heights, sort of a, like curved surfaces that they, they found problems with. And it was great to talk with architects on that. But they also liked the rapidity of, in, of switching between 2D and 3D. Now, now the curators actually thought it was fantastic. The curators focused more on the on-screen representation because they saw it as a way of very, very easily dealing with something that they're professionally less equipped to deal with, which is visualizing space and object. And that artists tend to have fairly decent spatial understandings. It gets drilled into you in art school. And it gets drilled into you by spending all day, every day, working with material objects. Curators tend to deal more thematically. So, so, the, idea of, so the idea of dealing with um, so the idea of actually very, really readily being able to visualize spaces that they have access to was useful to them. 
And something that the curators actually also pointed out from dealing with museum studies people, I did, um, I did some presentations with the Harvard History of Science Department with it. What they were really interested in was the, was the potential ability to hang shows in these galleries. So not just visualizing the space, but visualizing a show in the space. Sort of, what will this print look like in our gallery? What will, and also the didactic, the didact, the didactic potentials of that. Sort of, sort of, how might you use a system like this to teach people how to curate? Yep. And, and the, idea, the idea behind this is that I think that this is an interesting ch chunk of research because first off, it puts together a, um, first off, it puts together a system that's interesting. It's artist specific, but a lot of what I learned from it are things that are, that are actually very applicable both in a broader art world context and also in a broader professional context because I can see that sort of the idea of sort of having the, the quickness of 2D visual represent, 2D virtual representation to 3D physical representation could have potential influences. I mean, you could do anything from sort of order your own dollhouse using a similar sort of system and a web-based system where you sketch out the floor plan of your house and get a dollhouse shipped to your house for kids. You could, you could also use it in the aforementioned bits dealing with issues of curation. You could use it um, potentially with, with all sorts of ways where you, might be, where you might want to visualize people in physical spaces at very, very short notice using abstract source material. Now, now, what's also interesting with it is that for other, with the research is that for other art-related projects inside of HCI, the focusing on the institutional perspectives of art that I introduced it with, I think, are very interesting in a broader context dealing with not just process-specific ways of understanding art, but also considering art and HCI's relationship as a whole. And, and because, because it provides a grounded, critical frame of reference and also one that artists are very familiar with. So it's sort of the part, part and parcel of what was interesting about the original research in institutional theory was that all of the artists were very familiar with that. And that was something that allowed me to dig a lot deeper into their practices and get a lot closer to the why they did what they did by engaging with the theory that they were comfortable with than going at it blind what would have allowed me to do. And, um, and oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, go ahead and finish. Oh. Excellent. And, um, and, and, and lastly, the, the card-based ideation methodology, or technique, you can't call it a methodology yet. <laughs> the card-based um, ideation technique, I think, is something that, that, that's very useful from, from a much broader design practice perspective, in that, in that what it does is it lets you abstract. There, there's this tendency when you're a designer to go down towards the first idea that, that grabs your interest and really push it, but, but, but your first idea is very seldom your best idea. And, and by going through the sort of more holistic approach to dealing with design problems that the card-based technique suggested, you end up exploring your, your, your source material a lot more thoroughly and a, lot, and a lot deeper than you would if you just sort of looked over your notes and then went down the avenue of your, fir your first impulse. So, so I think that, I think that, that as, a, as a potential way of executing design projects is applicable both inside of an art context but also in a much broader context. But I think that it feels like time for Q and A-ish time because I, yep. Hi. Hey. So, uh, I, I like the approach that you took, and I uh, and I, I learned a lot about art from your presentation. But you get to a point now at the end where you actually have a tool which isn't necessarily just for artists. It's I mean you could imagine this for set designers or stage designers or you know for for design rather than art. So I I'm, I'm wondering how you come that come through that path and then end up with something that really isn't necessarily about art anymore? Or is that up there? Well, I, I think it is because it's not about making artwork itself. It's about supporting artists. And that's, and, and, they're, and, they're, and they're different things because, because an interesting thing about it is that, is that the one area where the artists that I was dealing with had very little problems with is they had very, they, had, they, they indicated they had very little need for things to help them conceive their artwork or deal with the artistic, with, with the codifiable artistic content of their work wasn't so much of what they had a problem with. What they had a problem with were the logistical concerns that actually, that, 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 and the hoops that they'd have to jump through in order to get their artwork made. So things, so things like not being able to visualize a space. Like, um, like, like Vieira had pointed out, the one who did the big plaster pieces, she'd pointed out that when she gets to the time of actually installing her work, her primary concerns are things like, is the, fall, is the floor going to fall through inside of this gallery? Will it fit through the door? These sorts of things were actually the, the things that she found extraordinarily problematic. Is that in the nature of the artist that you chose? So, for example, you know, you look at Hockney and how he's used the iPad to 
produce his artwork. I mean, some some artists would be more embracing of changing their techniques to adapt to existing technological tools than others, presumably. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I mean, the thing that's interesting about Hockney, though, is that is that if you look at his work as as, as you take it back further, Hockney's work works inside of a palette that's very conducive to projective light displays, sort of things like the iPad. In, in that in that Hockney's work, the way that he works with primary colors, he tends to work inside of a gamut that's very that's very conducive to the sorts of work that you do inside of an iPad, and it, and it also fits in thematically with what he does. He's he's, he's had he's always had sort of a very kind of populist means of producing his work, which is, quite, which is quite interesting. But there are lots of artists where that might not necessarily be the case. And, and, and the other side of things that I thought was interesting was that even though none of these artists kind of use technology in the final forms of their work, technology was almost ubiquitous throughout their studio. They all used laptops. They all used digital cameras as a means of producing their work. They all used, um, they all, they all conducted studies using cameras and videos and kind of scraping internet sites like, um, like Applebaum actually uses eBay as a primary research material, looking at patterns in fabric, looking at clothing, looking at sort of artifacts, sort of sort of reusing technology in this interesting way. And, and to me, these are the interesting these are the interesting aspects. Less the less the David Hockney's kind of artwork having technology in the final form, and more how can we make technologies to support the things that lead up to what might be an untechnological form? The the technology support the the technology support and inform the critical activities that lead up to the making of the work. So, so, so for me, the idea that you might have an application like this that can actually, that can actually help pre-visualize a space that much better, and allow the sort of the non-technical aspects to, to shine a bit better, to me, I think is a really valid outcome. Sorry, yeah. Oh, um, so it's a really. Uh, interesting uh, talk, uh, sort of a, t a talk of um, two halves, really, and, and both of which were interested in their own way. So, so the, the stuff that you came up with at the end, I think, it, it is is really interesting. And just going back to Abby's point, I, I think it's kind of interesting to extend beyond your original ideas of supporting artists to these more general things. I think that's, that seems a pretty um, cool thing. What, what I'm struggling with, I think, it is. Um, the kind of massive sort of theoretical foundations that you had, and then go to this very sort of practical solution. Both of them are interesting. I just I, I don't get how one really informed um, the other, right? And I just wonder whether you can talk a little bit about why. why I know you tried to do that at the end, but I, I'm just not convinced that that early stuff necessarily gets you to that later stuff. So maybe. You, you oh, know. absolutely. Yeah. The um the preliminary stuff. You mean the you mean the discussion of the art world concept? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all great. Yeah. Um, the, the, I'm just trying to make the link. From well, the what, what's interesting to me about the art world concept is that is that there's there's ways of thinking about art where you can think about it purely in terms of its expressive content and purely in terms of kind of the artist as auteur, sort of as the primary sort of focus in that in that in that artworks come purely from sort of the the mind and kind of vision of the artist and get manifest in some sort of way and then the world just deals with it. But, but from a professional context, that's not really the way that it works. And what's interesting is, is that this model of the art world kind of takes away the individualism of the artist and, and situates them in kind of a broader, in a broader social context and a broader professional context. And to, and to me, that opens up avenues of exploring how artists work with each other and work with kind of existing systems, ex existing social systems and existing structures in a way that... Um, in a way that's not immediately apparent if you focus on the idea of the artist as kind of a primary creative, um, creative practitioner in it, to, to the exclusion of their relationships with the galleries. Because, because this problem that I focused, the problem that I, that I ended up working on was actually a problem about the relationships between artists and their profession, the international nature of their profession and their relationships with galleries and gallerists. And that's an art world problem. That's not a... That's not a problem that's about individual practice. That's a problem about practice in a broader social and professional context. And to me, the, the art world model is interesting because it sort of reinforces the importance of that, that broader context, both from a critical perspective, but also from a practical perspective. Okay, we have time for more questions. Please, no more questions. We've asked to reiteration of the thesis because we do that in the interviews. We've only got one more question. If it's on a different topic, because I think if you want to go over the iteration of his argument. Uh, well, yes, I've got a question now. Not on the interview server. Excellent. 
Um, so I'm, I'm curious about the progression from the cards to the idea, because I understand the cards as a kind of a tool to take your subject matter and all of your field work and randomize it to a certain extent, and push you to generate ideas that are unexpected. My issue then is that you jump to this, to what we then see, see in your presentation is a thing that's very fully formed. And I'm, I, and I'm wondering whether there was a transitional period there where you used the cards in lots of different ways, developed lots of different ideas, and then gradually said, actually, this is the prime, primary one, or whether this... this oh, absolutely. There were, there were there, I had about, what, what I tend to do when I, when I do these sorts of things is that I work in, um, I, I, I kind of use a rule of three when I do it where what I did is I used the cards methodology and picked three concepts that started to gravitate towards me. One of them was, um, one of them was a system for capturing, ins for capturing documentation of your studio practice when you're kind of in the zone, where weirdly to step outside of your practice, you would have to, you would have to start taking pictures and, and redocumenting the work. So I'd, so I'd come up with, um, with three concepts using the card system. How do you explore this from a design perspective? Are you, are you sketching and prototyping at that point too with those three concepts, or oh yeah, kind of yeah, it's um, it's loads of work with a loads of work with a notebook and a sketchbook. Basically, dr drawing is actually a huge part of my process as well as the artist here. Where where when I come up with ideas for potential technologies, what I tend to do is draw screen interfaces. I do um, I do I do core diagrams of, of how a system might work. With this one, I have I have mountains of drawings of sort of um, of foam core models. Drawings of foam core models are a very strange thing to draw. Um, do you have a sketchbook with you at all? I do not have a sketchbook with me at the moment. Unfortunately, now I'm kicking myself for not having a sketchbook with me. But yeah, I, I keep, um, and what I tend to do is I tend to keep project specific sketchbooks. I do that on paper for the most part. I find that, I find that it's, just, um, it's just more flexible than keeping digital sketchbooks. And then in terms of the development of the project, it was a further iterative set of very specific research, like there was research in there that was outside the scope of this as, how do you make a foam core model? What's the best way to cut a corner joint? Should it be an automated process or should it be a handmade process? These sorts of things. Uh, I, mean, well, I mean, I think you were highlighting, that came to highlight this, the compression between the kind of the sketch, the interesting sketch of our, our world and then your, your, your design solution and Richard and came to pointing out what's the bit in the middle, which was kind of compressed in the presentation, didn't have enough time to go over yeah. this. Yeah, I, I tend to work with um, I tend to, to really um, from that side I tend to work with iterative design, where it's sort of you come up with you you progressively narrow down the scope of what you're doing, from lots of options really broad, to a specific option, and then three iterations around that specific option, gradually getting more specific and more focused as you go along. Um, they did do which 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 was quite good. In particular, um, the London-based artists had quite a bit um, bit of input in that. Um, Sinta Tantra, the one who did the wall pieces. What, what was fascinating to me was that she actually had ended up adopting model making quite a bit more significantly inside of a working process as a result of sort of dialogues over its potential use over time, which is, which is interesting. Because cause she tends to work, um, she tends to work at architectural scale. She's the one who did the big ceiling piece and the, the curved wall panels. But she also, um, do you know the bridge at Canary Wharf? Um, she, she, she did the mural that's across the bridge at Canary Wharf that was concurrent with this, so this, that it actually presented a very interesting project from a model making perspective that, that I'd collaborated with on, in terms of designing things because it's a very difficult space to visualize as a 2D image maker. She had to work with a space that was two meters by 100 meters, or I think 150 meters. It was a massive space to get the mural onto the bridge. So, so, so she'd actually ended up working with models as a means of visualizing that space and figuring out how to construct her source documents. So there's a lot of back and forth. And then there was there was more critical back and forth with the other artists, the New York based ones. One last question. I'm just curious about one of the factors that seemed to be missing was light. I was curious as to whether any of the artists asked for the model to be situated on Google Earth so they could look out how light would play across the room during the day, etc. You know, interestingly, um, Applebaum, at the time that this was going on, was working with a piece that was very heavily she she was she was just at the tail end of a series of work. That, that was kind of cyclical that dealt with a placed, placed sequence. So she was actually very interested in the light because um, using sequence as a material actually ends up being something where, depending on where the light's hitting them, you get massively different visual effects from, so, from, so, from sort of a matte color to a really, really reflective color. So she was very interested in sort of directional lighting, which is something that didn't make it into the final version of it, but, but is actually also, bizarrely enough, built into the Unity game engine 
you have sort of you have sort of like um you have basically geographically in time specific lighting options built built straight into the engine where you can say show me what the lights like at 10:30 in city center in Cambridge and it'll adjust the light to come from the right angle. No, it's just always <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, true enough. That might be an easy yeah. problem. Okay, th thank you. Uh, and uh, these are all great. I've got lots of you on the list. Some of you aren't. But, uh, That's cool. Thanks very much.